This week's blog post is the 11th in my series on the history of outdoor sculpture in New York City. It is on Daniel Chester French. A few words of introduction. This occasional series of blog posts will highlight the most important of the outdoor sculptures in New York City and provide some historical and art historical context. For photos of all outdoor sculptures in New York City in chronological order, see my Instagram page. The URL for that is the lower right. Posts 1 through 7 in this series looked at the subjects of outdoor sculptures in the order in which they appeared. In the first, we saw sculptures of animals and politicians. In the second, we saw our first military and literary heroes. The third post included a list of memorials to the Civil War. In the fourth post, figures active before 1800, including founding fathers. The fifth post was on businessmen. The sixth was on figures in the arts. And the seventh included allegorical figures through 1918. The next post in the series looked at sculptors who were famous in New York City and throughout America. John Quincy Adams Ward, a work of his is on the left, Augustus St. Gaudens, that's his work here, and Frederick McManus. This is his Nathan Hale. In this post, the last which is going to deal exclusively with one sculptor, I have focused on works by Daniel Chester French that are in or near New York City. For a wide range of French's works, see my post last year on Chesterwood, which is French's studio in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, now open as a museum. All right, let's look at French's early works. Daniel Chester French, 1850 to 1931, was two years younger than St. Gaudens, who lived 1848 to 1907, and 13 years older than Frederick McManus, 1863 to 1937. We are covering French after McManus because French's career didn't take off until slightly after McManus's did, and his career was still thriving after McManus's had petered out. French had little formal training in sculpture when he began creating works in the 1860s. His earliest attempts were small figures in the style of John Rogers. In the late 19th century, middle-class Americans purchased such small decorative objects by the thousands. French also sculpted busts of people that he knew. The Bronx Hall of Fame of Great Americans has four of French's busts, which were all done somewhat later, but are a reminder of his early works. During the 1870s, French spent a month at the studio of John Quincy Adams Ward in New York City and took drawing lessons with William Rimmer. Residents of his native Concord, Massachusetts, liked his work enough to give him his first major commission, the Minuteman sculpture, to commemorate the centennial of the battles of Lexington and Concord. As preparation, French traveled to Italy in 1875-76. French was given several commissions for sculpture for government buildings in the 1880s. In 1886-7, he briefly studied in Paris. And then in 1888, he moved his studio to New York City, a sure sign of a career on the rise. By the early 1890s, he was esteemed enough to be given one of the major commissions for the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. At 60 feet tall, his Republic towered over the Great Basin facing McManus' Ship of State, which we saw last week. The Ship of State is over here. Like the Ship of State, Republic was a temporary creation, but it was seen by 20 million or so visitors to the exposition. The sculpture put French, too, in on the ground floor of the City Beautiful movement as an artist capable of creating beautiful, elegant, allegorical figures to any scale. By 1897, French was splitting his time between New York City and his home and studio, Chesterwood, near Stockbridge. In New York, French was commissioned around 1900 to help with the elaborate sculptural program of the Brooklyn Museum. With Adolf Weinmann, he created the pediment whose central figures are art and science. On his own, French designed three of the cornice figures representing Greek epic poetry, Greek lyric poetry, and Greek religion. I've given you a link to an article with more information on these. French's first major work in Manhattan was a monument to Richard Morris Hunt, who had been America's premier architect, a leading designer of the Columbian Exposition, and an adopted New Yorker. As befits a monument to an architect who favored the Beaux-Arts style, the Hunt Memorial has significant elements of classical architecture. French's bust of Hunt 
and his full-length figures of sculpture and poetry were installed in 1901. Not long afterwards, French was commissioned to create a figure of alma mater to sit in front of Columbia University's Low Memorial Library, another City Beautiful building. Alma mater, unveiled in 1903, is the sort of elegant allegorical figure at which French excelled. Dressed in an academic robe, she bears a scepter topped by a crown. Because Columbia began as King's College, she has an owl tucked into her skirts, and she's flanked by torches that represent learning and wisdom. Again, I've given you a link to an article on my website with more information. French's largest project in New York City, and one of my favorites, is the set of four continents in front of the Customs House at Bowling Green. Placed in 1907, they represent America on the left, this is Africa, this is Asia, this is Europe. And I have argued on my website that these represent states of mind rather than comments about the actual inhabitants of those continents. In 1916, French's allegorical figures of Manhattan and Brooklyn were set in place at the east end of the new Manhattan Bridge. There they remained, covered with dirt from passing automobiles, until 1963. When Robert Moses decided to redesign the entrance ramps at the east end of the bridge, they were moved to the front of the Brooklyn Museum. Again, there's an article on my website with more about these. Brooklyn's Prospect Park has a large bronze relief by French of the Marquis de Lafayette, which was erected in 1917 during World War I to honor Franco-American friendship. French's works outside New York City from the 1890s to 1920 include several evocative, stunning memorials. His Milmore Memorial, also known as the Angel of Death and the Sculptor, was placed in 1893. His Melvin Memorial, also known as Morning Victory, was completed in 1908. Both stand in cemeteries in Massachusetts. The Metropolitan Museum has marble copies of both that are more familiar than the originals. Those are the two that I am showing you here. French's Trask Memorial, also known as the Spirit of Life, from 1915, is in Saratoga Springs. All right, moving on to French's later works. In the 1920s, French did two monumental works for Washington, D.C. His winged victory balances atop a 35-foot-high granite pillar for the 1st Division Memorial of the American Expeditionary Force, which served in World War I. It's rather difficult to see the figure in its present location, where it was unveiled in 1924, but Chesterwood has a beautiful model of the head. The monument is in President's Park, just south of the Executive Office Building. French's most recognized and reproduced work is, of course, the seated Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial, dedicated in 1922. It's 19 feet high. My posts on Chesterwood have images of French's models of this, which show how he decided on the design. In Sunnyside, just north of New York City, stands a memorial to the writer Washington Irving, who was dedicated in 1927. For this one, French created another distinctive bust, and he added relief figures of two of Washington's most famous characters, Bob Dill from Tales of the Alhambra and the hero of Rip Van Winkle. When French died, he was at work on a sculpture that he was creating purely for his own satisfaction, the Andromeda. It is still on display at his studio in Chesterwood. So, let's evaluate DC French. After the death of St. Gaudens in 1907, French was the foremost sculptor in the United States. His studio assistants included many of the notable sculptors of the early 20th century, all of whom created significant works in New York City. I've showed you several of them here. This one used to be in New York, but now it's down in Texas, alas. French is important not just as a teacher, of course, but for the type of sculpture he produced. He specialized in allegorical figures that were calm and dignified. Calm and dignified is not always what you need from a work of art. Sometimes you want the courage of the Sherman or the effervescent joy of McMahonese's Bacante with Infant Fawn. But if calm and dignity is what you need, it's difficult to find a better source than Daniel Chester French. DianeDurantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the free Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL on the screen or email me. 
and you can say well done Diane or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on dianedurantywriter.com. As always, thank you for listening.